Oh, the back that put away me. Hola, John. Hola, Vector, ¿cómo estás? Bien. Qué gusto verte. Sí, tú has visto la noticia de Borba. 
No, ¿qué dice? Él va a empezar en series. Él va a tener un canal. Un canal. Sí. Para, para estimular charlas en Latinoamérica. Sí. Ah, qué bueno. TV, TV también. Ah, le va, te va a hacer la competencia. Vas a, estar, vas a estar más, yo creo. Te va a hacer la competencia. En español. No, no, yo no, no tengo, sí nos conocemos, pero no tengo buena relación con él. Es regular, no es, no es buena. Oh, ok, ok. Así que yo prefiero Neurosurgical TV. Oh, ok. Tú eres, tú eres el líder, tú eres el father. Oh, ok, ok. <risa> ok, yo voy, ok. Tú, tú eres host. Tú eres el co-host ahora. Tú puedes dejar entrar personas. Sí, sí, está bien. Yo, yo he dado un derecho para... Ahmed también. Hola, Ahmed, ¿está allá? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Aquí es Victor. Diga hola. Yeah, Victor. I know him. Hi, professor. How are you? Hello, Amir. How are you doing? I'm very well about you, sir. I'm very excited to see you here, and uh, my honor to have you in our webinar. No, the honor is mine. Uh, I, I, I am happy to be here with all of you. Thank you it's so much. My, it's my pleasure, professor. So everything all set, Amen. What? Okay. okay, I would like to join uh, to add uh, yeah. Who, who do you need to come in the panel? Just let me know. Salim Abdullah. No, uh, Madrina, I'm gonna add her. Just tell me the name. Okay, I'm gonna make you. You know how to let people in, right, Ahmed? Uh, yeah, yeah. Because uh, okay, I, I made you, I made you co-host. Yeah, thanks. Okay, your camera's crooked. Okay. Oh, Margarita. Mute, mute. Hello. How you doing? How are you, Margarita? Mucho calor. It's too hot. In, it's in Madrid. It's caliente in Madrid. Too hot. There are, is, uh, Madalena. Madalena is here. Hello. Yes. Hello, Hello, everyone. Tu conoce uh, Margarita. Sí. Margarita Magdalena. Sí. The, yes. The number is Largo. Yes, the name, the name is, too, is too long, but um, I know her because he was participating in some uh, lecture of a dandy club uh, two months ago, I think. Oh, Dr. Llanos is in casa? No, Dr. Llanos is um, in operating room. He is always in operating room. Oh, oh okay. Doctor, doctor, doctor Abdul Raul know that uh, Kiko is always in operating room. Okay. Mm. Hi, Madalina, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you all. Um, How are hello you? everyone, it's so nice to, to be here and uh, to see you all the, uh, this evening and uh, I'm so glad that uh, I made it on time because uh, I just arrived from the hospital, I started my, uh, my summer practice and uh, I'm glad uh, it's, um, I, I'm on, on time and um, thank you all for, uh, for this event, I, uh, I can't wait for, uh, for the conferences and the lectures. Uh, I'm so excited. Mm -hmm. 
Hi, Professor. Can you hear me? Hello, guys. Good to see you. Good to see you all. Hello, Professor. Good to see me with you. Good to be with you all. I say Ahmad. I say Madalina. Hi, Professor. A lot of our friends are here. Hi. Professor Victor Huzo Perez is here. Yeah, a lot of our friends are here. Okay. Great. So what's uh, what's the schedule, guys? What is how does this go? Uh, I think uh, Professor uh, Hash Hisham and Basuri will be late uh, okay. for twenty minutes. Yeah, uh, I prefer to go early because so I was stuck at the airport in DC all night. Just got back to St. Louis, so all my meetings got changed because of the flight cancellations. So if I can go early. Uh, then I could move to the other things. Uh, so that would be better for me, actually. Good. You, you can start first. Today. Perfect. Perfect. When is the start? Uh, when is the start time? Uh, oh, hello, Salim. We start in about 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Okay, cool, 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 cool. Yeah, uh, John, yeah, if it's okay, I'd like to go first because yeah, all my fine. schedule... I got screwed up because of the flight cancellations. I just essentially walked in. Okay. Uh, I was supposed to get back last night. I just walked in. So all the meetings now got all confused. So if I can go first, that would help me from my perspective as well. Okay, it's up to Ahmed. He said it's okay. That's fine. Right, Ahmed? So. Well, I'm, I'm his boss. He has to say yes. Well, what, right. else is gonna, right. what else is he going to What else is he going to say? What else I mean, is no? <laughs> All right. And Dr. Cato's coming, right? Okay, Later, okay, good. Have you heard from her, uh, Ahmed? What? Dr. Cato is coming. No. She's on the schedule. I don't know. Maybe yeah. did you change the schedule? Yeah, Dr. Yoko Cato should be on here as well. Yeah. yeah. She's not should be yet. the last, I think. So we need to watch out for her in the panel, right? Coming yeah. in. Who who else are we expecting, Ahmed? Anybody else we're expecting? Any other speakers? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you could cut to, I guess, uh, she will join Well, you us. can let him in. You, you see him, right? You see him with her, right? Okay, yeah, you yeah. Let them in. You, you know how to admit people, right? Of course. Okay. Uh, let me mute my.
Hi everyone. John? Hello. Welcome. Welcome, Dr. Salim. Welcome, Dr. Victor. Dr. Ahmed. Hello, Dr. Adnan. Good to, good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you, Dr. Yes. How are you all? Very well. Thank you. Good to see you. See you too. Okay, Takashi. I'll let Takashi 
I think uh, Professor Salim will start first. Yeah, well, I'm going to let Takashi introduce you, okay, Ahmed? Uh, good, good evening. Yeah. Takashi, good evening. There? Yeah, uh, I'm there. So I'm Takashi Kon um, okay. Takashi. from Tokyo, Japan. Yeah. Takashi, will you do me a favor and introduce Ahmed for Neurosurgical uh, TV? Just say, hi, I'm Takashi yeah. Kon from uh, yeah. Japan. And introduce yourself and then say, I'd like to introduce Ahmed. Algamani, ahead of the Walter Dandy and Yemen. Okay, and he's going to run the show. Okay, so okay, you just um, have yeah. to introduce uh, uh, Ahmed. That's all, and he takes over. Okay, so uh, introduce yourself. Introduce if you want in neurosurgical TV. If not, that's fine. And then introduce okay. Ahmed. Yeah, he's a uh, neurosurgical this... resident, right, Ahmed? What? You're a resident, correct? Not yet. No, no, no. I'm 50 old medical student. Okay, uh, this is Takashi Kon. I'm from Tokyo, Japan. I'm the neurosurgeon from Tokyo, Japan. Um, this time, so now 2 a.m., but I uh, woke up and uh, <laughs> before going to bed. But uh, I, very... can you put your face on at all? Or no? Uh, no, yeah, no, sorry, no, so I, I can, cannot now. So uh, I'm just uh, yeah, going back. Please bed, put your uh, face so you can introduce somebody. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> okay, so yeah, I can so now. Uh, so just uh, before going to bed, but uh, I'm very interested to attend this meeting. So now oh, to uh, oh, uh, is it possible for you to put your camera on? Uh, no, no, I, I cannot uh, take the camera now. He's not in the bed list. Yeah. Oh, you don't yeah. have it. Okay, now, let me introduce him then. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm editing him. Yeah. Hold, hold on. I'll introduce you. Ahmed. Hold on. Okay. Okay, Ahmed, are you ready? Just a minute, there is something going. Okay, I'm ready. Okay, here we go. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Good afternoon from Miami Beach, home of Neurosurgical TV. Today, we have the honor of hosting uh, the, Yemen, um, <clears throat> the Yemen Walter Dandy Club, uh, that has four presentations. And we'll let Al, uh, Ahmed Al Ghamani, the, the head of the group, uh, run the show. Good day, Ahmed. Uh, hi, dear John. Uh, first of all, thank you for uh, hosting this webinar. Uh, here is Ahmed Al Ghamani, the president of Walter Eden University University Club of Yemen, and also a marketing administrator at Abdurrahman University of Neurosurgery, which is considered the first online academic degree in neurosurgery worldwide. Uh, it's my honor uh, to have uh, this uh, great webinar with the uh, great uh, professors from around the world. Uh, so the first uh, presentation and show will be with uh, Professor Salim Amdurov, who is the um, uh, founding and chairman of the Neurological Surgery, surgery at St. Louis University, and also the global president of the uh, Walter E. Dandy Society. Hi, Professor Salim. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmad. Thank you for the excellent work you're doing. In, uh, in creating the, the, the Yemen club for us and the amazing uh, connections that you're creating around the world for your country. I want to recognize John Bennett for all his efforts around the world to, to transmit education in the field of neurosurgery. Um, also recognize uh, Dr. Takashi very late at night in Japan, he's here and he's been very involved with us and you know, his efforts are, are tremendous. So without further ado, the topic we were given today was to, um, to discuss the, uh, the anterior part of the skull base. So what I'm gonna do here is to uh, engage you on this uh, presentation, uh, but I wanna make it fun because we have people for, from different levels who are uh, joining here. And uh, I wanted to um, like, you know, make it a little bit more interactive uh, and ask some questions as we proceed along here. Okay, so let me do this here. Okay, so let me bring this. So today, so we are talking about an area, I'm gonna talk about an area, this small right here. So this is the anterior clinoid right there, okay? Anterior clinoid. 
the internal carotid artery enters the subarachnoid space right from underneath the anterior clinoid right here, right next to the optic nerve. I'm going to discuss this area right here as part of the, the symposium today and discuss the anatomic or surgical relationship in this tiny little baby area uh, that are so critical for skull base surgeons and vascular neurosurgeons. Okay. So, and I want to interact with the students as well. Um, and what I'm going to use here actually will make it easier is the first couple lessons in my module. Uh, let's see, let me share. If you look at here, so let's see how I make this big. So essentially, looking from the front, we're looking at the carotid artery here, okay? Let me do this. So this is the internal carotid artery here coming up. At this level is where I showed you is the anterior clinoid, okay? Then the carotid artery will continue to go this way, of course, to divide into the anterior cerebral artery and the middle cerebral artery. This relationship right here is of critical importance, which is the two, uh, the, the optic nerve right next to the carotid artery here, that's the other side, of course, a chiasm, okay? So I just wanna talk about this region a little bit, okay? And I want to uh, just kind of go over that and make sure that we understand the surgical anatomy of this region, which is so important, okay? In this depiction, this is a cut portion of the optic nerve. That's another portion. That's a right optic nerve, and this is a left optic nerve. Look at this very important relationship between the carotid artery, our portion that we're talking about, the subarachnoid portion, and the optic nerve. So that will become an important thing, especially when I talk to you about the surgical implications of uh, what is going on here. So for this segment, what we are going to do, we can appreciate this relationship with this artery as it enters the subarachnoid space. We are going to talk, look at its uh, main branches, okay? That will gonna be coming off here, 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 and another small one here. And we are going to talk about the pathologies of, uh, of, uh, that affects this artery. Specifically, of course, we are very interested today to look at the surgical approaches to this artery. How do we get here? How do we get here safely? How do we do surgery in this region? And what kind of surgeries we need to be doing in this region? Next, I would like to take you through a three-dimensional model to expose the internal carotid artery. I want you to appreciate here that we have a craniotomy we call a frontal temporal craniotomy right here, okay? And specifically, the name of this craniotomy is a terrional craniotomy. The other thing I want you to notice is this specific structure right there that you're seeing that I wanna to expose to you right here and the best way you could see it is right there. That is our optic nerve. Now, as you know, and I've been discussing this with you, the close relationship between the optic nerve and the carotid artery that I described. So the carotid artery will be here, deeper in, below the bone, and that's the optic nerve. So now that you three-dimensionally understand where the optic nerve, of course, that's the location from the front of the anterior clinoid from inside the orbit. So that's, I want you to connect those dots. the orbit right there. 
it has a close relationship to the carotid artery. So by looking at this three-dimensional model, it gives you an understanding for us to expose the carotid artery. We somehow need to go from here, from this point here, to that point here. How are we gonna go from there to there? By opening the area that we are calling right there that I'm gonna show you better. We're calling the sylvian fissure. By entering the sylvian fissure, which is between the frontal and temporal lobes, it will allow us to access the cistern in which both the carotid artery and the optic nerves sit. Now I would like to, okay, so let's look from above. We're looking from above down at a cadaveric dissection and let's go through the structures. So just, just you remember, I showed you from one side, this is the area of the anterior clinoid, okay? That bone, we look, showed you from right side. Now we're showing you both sides looking from above down. So imagine the patient is, uh, you're sitting at the top of the head, the legs are away from you and you're looking down. So this is our friend, the right optic nerve. This is the left optic nerve, okay? That's the relationship. You see the carotid artery enters this region below the optic nerve, which is entering right here. So they see the close relationship, then divides into the middle cerebral artery and the anterior cerebral artery here, okay? This here is the, uh, is the chiasm right there. Okay. Okay. All right, so there are a few other structures that I want to bring your attention to. Um, uh, does any of the students who's watching know what this structure right here is? This white structure right here? Any of the students on the on the live uh, chat? Uh, you want to have uh, give me a guess what this white structure is? Let's see if I can see the chat here. Put out your stock. Very good, Suleiman. Very nice, okay. So this is, this is a, the hypothalamus is behind us. This is a pituitary stalk. This is a pituitary gland right here below us, okay. So we, the microsurgeons come from the sylvian fissure this way to look into this area. The endoscopic surgeons come from the nose to they come here. So that's a pituitary gland. So among the very smart people watching, what is this vessel coming of the internal carotid artery here? What are these vessels? Anybody give me a guess? Uh, Come on guys. Come on now. Yeah, and that's cool. always something like that, right? Yeah. Superior, superior hypophyseal yes. artery. So we all know the, uh, very good. So we all know the big arteries that come out of the carotid artery, right? So behind us here, the carotid comes in, underneath will be the ophthalmic artery. We know well. Then we have behind us here is gonna be the posterior communicating in the anterior choroidal that we know well. But the superior hypophyseal arteries are tiny arteries that come from the medial part of the carotid go towards the, the, the pituitary in the stock. This is the superior hypophyseal arteries. Now, they're only important, really true importance from a surgical perspective is the fact that you can form what's called the superior hypophyseal aneurysm around the superior hypophyseal artery. So these superior hypophyseal aneurysms can be very tricky they come at the origin 
And now this explains to you why the superior hypophysial aneurysms are different. They're pointing medially. Why do they point medially? Because the hypophysial artery comes out medially. So the anatomy of the superior hypophysial aneurysm is totally different. It's a totally different thinking about it because it's coming off here. Whereas the posterior communicating artery aneurysm will be coming this way and the anterior choroidal aneurysm will be coming this way and the ophthalmic aneurysm will be just underneath the optic nerve sitting here. So the location of where the origin of the original artery is as a surgeon gives you the anatomic understanding of what way the aneurysm is gonna be pointing and what way surgically, technically you need to deal with it, okay? So understanding this anatomy is very important and I'm glad we're covering this, okay? So that's the superior hypophysial artery, very good. You guys doing a great job, okay. All right, so, so this would be the cella underneath us, okay? That's the pituitary stock. So this is our friend, the carotid artery on this side. This is our friend, the carotid artery on this side, okay? Um, okay, uh, uh, let me ask, what are the, this, uh, while we're at it, let's just have a good time together. What are these, this artery, a couple arteries coming out here from right here? What is the name of this, uh, these arteries? Who's gonna give me an answer? I mean, from middle cerebral artery? Or, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. the, uh, yeah. Lenticulo striates. Yeah. So these are the lateral, lateral lenticulo striates, very important vessels. Okay. As a surgeon, when you're coming down here, if you mess with these arteries, we're going to give a pa uh, the patient 100% a deficit. Okay. Uh, th there's no two ways about it. Okay. The lenticulo striate arteries, uh, these perforating vessels that you cannot be messing around with. Okay. The reason I want to explain to you why these arteries are so sensitive, these are end arteries. So as they go here, they go straight, you know, to the internal capsule, to the basal ganglia and everything. They don't have a lot of collateral flow like some other arteries do. So an end artery goes straight like this and it supplies the structure. Whereas a lot of these larger arteries, they have a lot of interconnections. And sometimes if there is an obstruction, you can get flow. But these arteries do not tolerate that any kind of, uh, you know, messing around with them. So my advice is do not ever mess around with the lenticular strides. Now, why am I saying this to you? When you're doing surgery, you're coming, uh, you are coming from the sylvan fissure, you're coming this way, right? Always stay on the lateral aspect of the middle cerebral artery never dissect on the medial aspect. Why? So you're coming down sylvan fissure. I see people going this way that, no, there is no reason in the world you to be, to be here, okay? There's no rationale in the world for you to be operating here. So always stay on this side, never on this side of the M1. Simple rule, no, there's no indication, okay? Don't, don't, Okay, so this is the kind of stuff that I want really the people to understand to avoid complication, okay? So those, that's why I make, I'm not making these points for anatomic reasons, okay? I'm making them because of their impact from a surgical perspective. And that's the point I'm trying to make here, okay? Very good. All right, let's continue. All right, you, you guys doing a good job, all right? So you're making this easy for me. All right, let's go. Structure here meaning the okay so how do we expose the internal carotid Next, artery in surgery i'd like to take you to an actual surgical okay now let's talk about real surgery okay we talked enough anatomy now we're going to talk surgery we're coming in from the right side through the right sylvan fissure like we showed you the terrional craniotomy that means this is our right temporal lobe this is our right frontal lobe, okay? This space in between is our sylvian fissure. So we just went through here. Remember we talked about the anatomy. We got the optic nerve. What does that mean? That means this is our friend, the carotid artery, okay? Now, this, this patient has this 
thing sitting right here, which is an aneurysm. But now you know what aneurysm this is. You see, because you know the understanding, this is an ophthalmic aneurysm based on what I explained to you. It is not a hypophysial aneurysm. Remember why? Because you know now. Hypophysial aneurysm will be coming off on this side going that way. Now you know, okay, I understand. I know how to name it right. I know surgically how I deal with it, okay? So that's very important, okay? It's pushing on the optic nerve, all right? So that's fine. So right optic nerve, carotid artery, we continue. Cool approach to the internal carotid artery. And first, let me define for you the anatomy as we have discussing uh, this. Okay, a couple of things, technical things. I don't use retractors, which I believe personally is less uh, traumatic to the brain, but if you use them, that's fine. I use a suction in my left hand and micro scissors in my right hand. Okay, that's all you need. You don't need expensive instruments, image guidance, crazy stuff. You don't because you know your, your anatomy. Okay, so keep it, keep it that way. All right. So suction left hand on low suction, micro scissors right hand. Okay, but you could, uh, I can uh, use both hands for everything. So it, depending on the situation, sometimes I'll have the scissors in my left hand, the suction in my right hand, depending what situation I'm in. And that's how I want to train you. By the way, this reminds me, during the Granada Spain Congress coming up in September, I'm gonna do a live demonstration on a cadaveric head that we will transmit around the world where I'm gonna go through all this anatomy live under a microscope. So please mark your calendars. Those of you who are not gonna be in Granada, we will transmit this live to you and we will go through all these regions in a very, uh, in an operating room kind of a setting where I'm gonna explain all this anatomy to you in a lot of detail. So please make sure you're gonna be there, okay? Area uh, so far. Okay, so another question coming up now, stay awake with me, please. What is this structure over here I'm seeing? White structure. Come on, guys. These are very quick questions. I want very quick answers. Who's going to tell me real fast? Why are you guys being quiet? Are you shy? No <laughs> shy. No shy. Yeah, please. Who's going to tell me what is that white structure? Madalena. I'm gonna start calling names. Oh, no, Victor, are you there? Oh, Victor knows this stuff. Hey. Okay, so of course, this is our right optic nerve. That has to be our left optic nerve, right? So they come together to form the chiasm here. Right and left optic nerve, you're looking from the right side, okay? Surgical anatomy, okay, very cool. All right, let's keep going. Okay. So this is a right-sided terrional approach. That's a temporal lobe here, arachnoid carotid artery, because it occurs. In this case, I'm working around a arachnoid swimming in. Now I'm going to go more this way. I'll show you. Fluid in this area, and it's also known as a supraclinal carotid, because so this this portion of the carotid. We, can, we have a couple different names. This is a subarachnoid portion of the internal carotid artery because it sits in CSF. Before this level, and uh, you know, we can go into those uh, classifications if you take my course, we call it different names because before this point, it's not sitting in CSF. So it's not subarachnoid space. Or we can call it the clinodal carotid because the cl anterior clinoid is right here. We could call it the clinodal carotid. Very this good. Projection of bone right here is the anterior clinoid. Known as the anterior. So that's our clinoid. old friend, the anterior clinoid. Okay. So, so that's what we are now. And as we uh, look at this artery, as you watch me doing this surgery here, you will see that I, in my left hand. Okay, I mentioned that already. Okay. 
the, um, now, uh, the now I'm coming following the carotid uh, the, the optic nerve and coming back this way. I want you to look at this. This is at the level of the proximal sylvian fissure. I'm coming back this way. Okay. The only way I'm going to be able to follow the carotid artery to the bifurcation into the anterior cerebral artery and the middle cerebral artery is for me to get back here. The reason I'm doing this is uh, you will see. The vessels you see? from the surrounding structures. So from here to here is the optic nerve. About this level is the chiasm. This is the optic tract, okay? So that's very important. In this case, I'm working around a vein, a sylvian vein. Be careful not to injure these veins. Carotid. Very important, okay? Now, what are we seeing? Do you see the nice thing? Not having retractors injuring the frontal lobe, I can work in the area I'm in without injuring the brain. Very smooth, very nice, okay? Without hurting anything. And as most of you know, I do all this awake. You don't have to do it awake. That's really for very experienced surgeons. But I am also talking to the patient, make sure there is nothing happening that is concerning, okay? But as far as the dissection, the sharp dissection, all of you guys should be able to do it that way. Here, I think it's important to know. So essentially, we said that this is our optic nerve, okay? That's important also from an anatomical stequatic artery on the right side. So where are we going to get to? Okay. Now we're seeing something interesting happening. All right. Let's guys, don't be shy with me. Okay. I want to ask you. So you think about, it. so this is a carotid artery or friend. Now I'm seeing something interesting coming this way. What is the structure right here? Okay, guys, quick, tell me an answer, please. Who's gonna tell me what that is? It's look like A1. Yes. So the carotid artery is coming here and it's gonna bifurcate into the anterior cerebral artery going that way. And the middle cerebral artery is gonna be going this way into the cerebral fissure. So that is the A1 segment of this vessel. Very nice. Okay. Let's keep going. Let's expose it. Let's expose it. Two, we are going to get to the bifurcation. Now, the internal in this patient, there's an interesting structure into here. The middle cerebral artery and the anterior cerebral artery. In this patient, We've got another aneurysm. So that's a carotid artery dividing into the anterior cerebral artery, middle cerebral artery, and there is an aneurysm sitting right here, okay? This is the end of the carotid artery. So we call this a carotid bifurcation aneurysm, okay? Just based on the location. Carotid bifurcation aneurysm between the A1, the M1, carotid bifurcation aneurysm, okay? So that's how we do this, okay? Uh, in this case, we have an aneurysm, right? It's, there. A, it's quite okay. a complex aneurysm, you see. It's bilobed, okay? It's got perforators, you know, it's just one of these things. And that's why I've just put a temporary clip to dissect this aneurysm, okay? So we will uh, here show you that there is an aneurysm at the bifurcation. So let's follow the carotid artery. Right here, okay, in the anterior cerebral artery. So we already talked here. about it. anterior okay. cerebral artery, this patient middle cerebral. Has a uh, what we call a bilobe. You see, two lobes to this aneurysm. Uh, we These... will be discussing aneurysms in the next lesson, but I wanted to show you the anatomy of what there, and then the beginning of. See, that's the anterior, anterior cerebral, cerebral artery. artery. That's and our bilobe aneurysm right here. Okay. So that's, uh, okay, so that's really the, just the initial Next, anatomy I to that I want to do. About the uh, neural imaging okay. of the internal carotid. Okay, let's stop here. Let me go to the next one to continue. Okay, let's go to part two. I would like to thank Dr. Takashi 
we are translating these lessons into multiple languages and he is actually translating them into Japanese for us. He has been yes. tremendous for us and we really appreciate his effort. So these lessons are being translated into, into Spanish, Portuguese, uh, uh, Chinese, Japanese, uh, Russian. So multiple languages uh, that, uh, especially in countries where people, uh, uh, medical school is not taught in English, okay? So, and I appreciate Dr. Takashi's, yes, um, okay. So let me just uh, do one more thing. I'm gonna ask a question. That's not gonna be an easy question, but let's ask it. Uh, because every lesson we ask a question uh, before you take the lesson and then you give us, uh, then you take the lesson and then you give uh, answers. So the first question is, this is a lateral view of the carotid artery, okay? What is this vessel coming out here? Okay. So you saw, as we're looking at the carotid artery, we saw you come, this is where it, from here to here is a separating artery portion. Clearly this is the ophthalmic artery, okay? Uh, this cannot be the superior hypophyseal because it's going this way. Uh, the superior hypophyseal will be going this way. So this is a posterior communicating artery, okay? So that's nice. Okay, uh, let's see this one, okay, next. Okay, now this is, a, this question is a little bit difficult. Okay, now this is an atomic view from below, okay? So remember, we're looking from below the brain. So this would be our carotid artery coming in on the right side from below. And right next to it is the optic nerve that we have known around the, the anterior clinal. Carotid artery continues. Okay, right here. And there is this artery coming out right here. Okay. What is this artery, folks? What is this artery? Who's gonna tell me the answer? Who's the brave one among you? This one in green is the posterior communicating That's artery. That's exactly right. It's the posterior communicating artery. I'm showing it from below. You see, that's the carotid artery. Comes here. It uh, gives the ophthalmic there, whatever, and then comes and it has this big branch from underneath the posterior communicating artery. How do you know? Well, it's supposed to get for many reasons. Posterior communicating come here. It goes around the brain stem to become the posterior cerebral artery right there, okay? So that's the posterior communicating artery. That's very good. Okay. So let's say, is that one of the answers? Good. Okay. Good. Next. Now, this is not an easy one. Okay. Let's see. Imagine you're looking at the person from the side. So this is a front. This is a back. This is the top of the head. This is a bottom. And we're looking here. Okay. So. This is our internal carotid artery, okay? That is our third cranial nerve, the oculomotor nerve, okay? All right. This is our basilar artery. Now, I know I'm adding a lot of stuff and you have not watched these lessons, but uh, you know, I'm not making it easy for you, but uh, this is not an easy one, okay? This is a basilar artery, okay? And it has the two PCAs here and here. P1s, okay? That's the third cranial nerve. This is, of course, this is the midbrain, that's the thalamus, okay? Okay, uh, so the question is, what's the red arrow? What is the red arrow showing? So to get to that, let's, uh, let's continue with the lesson and we'll come back because this one is a little bit more difficult, okay? Uh, let's just pick. Uh, a wrong answer, fine. Okay, okay. we got two out of three, fine. Uh, let's go into the lesson and see what we're gonna do. All right. So we're looking at this area again, a little bit more. Okay, what can, that once you have finished taking it, 
the posterior of circulation, I'm going to show it to you in about using the specific. Uh, okay. So let's look at from above a different view a little bit. Okay. Before, remember, we're going back to your old friends. We have our optic nerve. Fine. Then we have the carotid artery just below it, remember. Remember this tiny little baby thing? We said that's a superior hypophysial artery. We told you that the uh, ophthalmic artery is gonna be right below it, right there. And then the posterior communicating and the anterior choroidals will be coming out of the carotid as it continues. Okay, very good. Let me add another structure. This is the edge of the tentorium. Okay, edge of the tentorium. This is the third, cran third cranial nerve, number three, okay? That's our old friend, the pituitary gland. That's the pituitary stock. What is this structure right here? Who's gonna tell me? What is that structure? Anyone? Okay, that's a fourth cranial nerve. Okay, this space right here is the cavernous sinus. That's a whole lesson right there. The all everything inside this is a cavernous sinus. Okay, so let's continue. This is actually you can hardly see. This is a sixth cranial nerve right down here. Okay, okay the very first section, I want to point right there. Essentially, the basal artery would be sitting this. right here. Yeah. The basal artery would be sitting right here and, against the clivus. Uh, as I'm trying to three dimensionally. So now, what I'm trying to explain the posterior communicating artery will come off here. The basal artery will send P1, P1, okay. Posterior communicating artery comes here and joins the P1. So this now becomes P2, okay? After the PCOM joins. So that is how the posterior communicating artery joins the, uh, the posterior cerebral artery. So if you have an aneurysm right here, we call it a posterior communicating artery aneurysm. If you have an aneurysm here, we call it a basal or apex aneurysm. Uh, if you have an aneurysm right here, we call it a P1 aneurysm. And if you have one of these weird aneurysms back here, we call it a P2 or P3 aneurysm, okay? So just based on the location, folks. Okay. We explain as we move forward. Uh, in so if we go back. Let me show you an atomic view of this, okay? So that's our carotid artery as we've known it, posterior communicating artery right here, okay? Joining what? This is the top of the basal artery. This is P1. And that becomes P2, okay? Right there. What's underneath us is very important in relationship to this, is the third cranial nerve right there, okay? That's very important to understand the relationship. These tiny arteries, are the most important arteries in the human body, the most important tiny baby arteries. Uh, does anybody know what we call these baby arteries? Somebody tell me what, they, what we name these. These are what make surgery of basal or apex aneurysm very dangerous. And someday when I get to meet you to talk about basal or apex aneurysms, we're gonna get into this. But what, do you, what is it, what is the name? we give to these tiny baby arteries, which I have called the most important tiny arteries in the human body. Okay, you guys are being sharp. Posterior thalamo perforators. Okay, if you occlude these arteries, the patient may never wake up. This is what can cause coma in a patient, okay? And it's a disaster. This is why this area is very, very sensitive, okay? So, okay, let's continue. To the anatomic structure. Yeah. We become the anterior cerebral artery. 
page. So let's go back to our old friends. Here. The the uh, the uh, uh, internal carotid artery. Let's look from the side again. We went through this anatomy many times, but I want to do it again because we have some junior people here. I want to make sure they understand this anatomy very well. So this is our friend, the internal carotid artery right here. Okay, we're looking from the side. We drilled what's called. We removed the anterior clinoid. Why did we remove the anterior clinoid? Because by removing the anterior clinoid, we could look deep underneath here, and we're seeing our ophthalmic artery going into the orbit right there. Okay, so that's our ophthalmic artery. Okay, now. This artery goes in, as we saw in the last case, becomes the anterior cerebral artery here going this way, and the middle cerebral artery going back this way, okay, towards the sylvan fissure. Okay. Now, here is our posterior communicating artery going out this way, and, the, and behind this is going to be the tiny anterior choroidal artery there. So this is posterior communicating artery going behind us. Okay. And as you recall, of course, that's our uh, right optic nerve, left optic nerve, just like the anatomy we showed you in the surgical case, okay? The last case we showed you, there is an aneurysm sitting here, okay? That's very good. Just anatomically, so you understand very well, this here is the left internal carotid artery on the other side, and we're seeing it from a side view right there. We cannot see our superior hypophyseal artery because it's on the other side. So it's going to be there, the origin of it on the medial side, we cannot see that some of its branches. That is why we have said in the literature to expose the superior hypophyseal artery, and I wrote uh, a comment about this, it's easier to access it from the opposite side. See here, we know that where the superior hypophyseal artery, so sometimes it's easier to clip an aneurysm, a superior hypophyseal aneurysm from the contralateral side. It's easier for me to see the left superior hypophyseal than it is for me to see the right, okay? So those are important things to keep in mind in that perspective. All right, let's keep going. The tentorium. This is the area- That's the edge of the tentorium. That's the third nerve. You see how close it is to the posterior communicating artery. We talked about that. that the, this is uh, the cavernous the, sinus. Uh, relationship is important. This region back here. Behind the carotid, where the posterior communicating joins the posterior cerebral artery. That. Okay, let's do a surgery together, guys. Okay. So, uh, as we're entering an actual surgical case, I would like to go over this with you. We are this time going in from the left side. As you know, so far, we have come from the right side. I showed you this right-sided boot. In this specific case, we're coming in from the left side, okay? So what is our, um, our trajectory? So essentially, we are going to, first of all, we have what's called, a, again, a terrione craniani right here. That's our terrional craniotomy uh, that we have talked about in our first lesson. Okay. And what we are going to do is enter between the frontal and temporal lobes through the sylvian fissure right here. So that's going to be our trajectory to, to enter uh, from that center. And the reason is, is that what we're trying to do is get again to this deep area. If you could imagine that there's a point here where the carotid artery and the optic nerves are, and uh, then we are going to go through here, through this location here to, to enter that area, which is essentially what are we looking for in this specific case? Because we're looking from the left side, we're going to have our optic nerve like this, and then we're going to have our carotid artery next to it right here. Okay. 
So that's it's like the opposite what I like to mirror see. image, what I showed and you on the right side. As we know, that the carotid artery divides into the anterior cerebral artery and the middle cerebral artery. Now, in this specific lesson, what we're looking at and specifically looking for is the posterior communicating artery, which will be right here. And based on our orientation so far, the edge of the tentorium would be somewhere right here, and the uh, third nerve would be somewhere right here. So that would be the view from the left side that we will be looking at. Let's now enter into an actual surgical scenario. This is a left-sided transylvian approach. So let's orient our, ourselves. So this is the left frontal lobe. This is the left temporal lobe. This is our internal carotid artery here. I see A, okay. And this is our optic nerve here becoming the optic chiasm back here. Okay, so that's, that's oriented in this process. Uh, the carotid artery, as you know, will go on to divide into the middle cerebral artery and the anterior cerebral artery here. So that's orientation to the approach. Uh, this angle right here is the sylvian fissure. We're coming through the sylvian fissure on the left side to enter this area. Okay, so this specific case is for me to orient you to the posterior communicating artery. In this specific case, we're actually I'm operating on a large tumor in the base of the skull. This is all tumor down here, but that's really not the focus of this specific demonstration. It's just I'm using it to, uh, to explain to you how to handle the, uh, the posterior communicating artery. So, so here I am, this is my left hand. I have this suction device. In the right hand, I have these micro scissors. This is the temporal lobe, the mesial part of the temporal lobe, which we call the uncus. I'm mobilizing it to get on this side of the coronary artery. And as you see, I'm cutting these arachnoid layers to expose them. So this is now I'm zooming in a little bit more. And now we get to our friend here of what we are working on today. So essentially, so this is a carotid artery here, as we said, and then it has this branch right here, okay? That is our posterior communicating artery, okay? So that's on the lateral side on the lateral side, in this case, the left side, uh, we expose the posterior communicating artery, okay? And just as we talked about, the, uh, just to get three-dimensionally out of view, the edge of the tentorium would be somewhere here behind us. And the third nerve, we would be expecting it to have somewhere deeper here. So that's the anatomy that we're looking at. Um, and let's continue to dissect in this area. So as you see, this is our posterior communicating artery right here. What you're looking here is a uh, craniopharyngioma, a tumor embedded deep in here. Uh, so I'm now dissecting in front of the PCOM to get into this area right there, okay? So this is just to give you an appreciation uh, of what we have. Uh, let me show you one more thing. Now, we've talked about how the uh, posterior communicating artery connects with the posterior cerebral artery. So right here behind us is the basilar artery, okay? And uh, uh, just we see behind the tumor here, okay? Now, 
we talked about how the basal artery comes up, comes up. Now, this would be behind us. We're not seeing it. It would have this, uh, its final branch, which is going to be the posterior cerebral artery. Okay. And so we talked about how the posterior communicating artery is going to go and connect to this artery there. And that's going to happen all behind us here. I'm just trying to give you the three-dimensional view of how we, we see this and where we expect things to happen. So here it is. Uh, that's our posterior communicating artery here. And now we're dissecting in front of the posterior communicating artery to, be, uh, to get into this uh, deeper area. Essentially, we are now in the posterior fossa uh, in front of the brain stem and in front of the basal artery. Now, I would like to show you. We talked about this. Let me just finish with this. Yeah, this brings us to the final thing that I want to talk about. To another cadaveric view of the So this is very complicated, but it puts everything together for us. And I'm going to end it with this. This is a question I asked early on. So. This is a front. This is, we're looking at the left side, left side. This is a front. This is a back. This is the top of the head. This is a bottom. Okay. So let's follow what we know. Internal carotid artery coming in. Okay. We're not seeing the front part, the anterior client node and everything else. Okay. And it continues. Okay. And actually what we're seeing here, this is going inside the sylvan fissure to be a middle cerebral artery. Okay. This is a thalamus. This is a midbrain. This is a pons. Okay. This is a basal artery. Okay. And it's two uh, branches right here, the two posterior cerebral arteries. Okay. So, this question I asked early on, and this is the third nerve here. What is this artery? That's our friend, the posterior communicating artery. See, right there. That's our friend, the posterior. You see, if you really follow it, it is connecting with the P P1 here, right there. Okay. So that's it's a difficult question, but it is the posterior communicating artery. Okay. Uh, so this becomes the posterior cerebral artery here. All right. Difficult anatomy, uh, but we went through all the principles together. This is really why we created this University of Neurosurgery. When I was a resident, it took me a couple of years to understand all this stuff because there's no book that explains this. So, uh, you know, I, I ultimately, we created this to make it easier for people to understand the surgical anatomy of, uh, of these things, all right? So it's been a pleasure to be with you guys here. I, I, I think that's about all we're going to cover today. I mean, we could go for hours with this kind of thing, but I think this was the orientation that we wanted to do from uh, my perspective. Um, okay, so let's stop share here. All right, so, uh, so if there are any questions for me, I'm happy to take them, but I know we have other speakers here, okay? Um, Hopefully with time, I will spend time with all of you guys in really taking you through this kind of understanding of the surgical anatomy. Plus, as I said, in September, I'm gonna do a live dissection that all of you can watch, even if you're not in Spain, uh, uh, under the microscope, where I'm gonna go through all this anatomy, all these vessels, all the skull base anatomy in one session. I'm gonna go through with you a very systematic way, all the surgical anatomy of this area uh in september and we will make announcements of course about that so it's been a pleasure to be here and uh i want to respect the other speakers uh, uh so uh, you know I, th I think i will stop here um ahmed and dr takashi if there are any questions that people have about anything i said i'm happy uh uh you know happy to answer anything
Okay, so uh, I'm Takashi Kon from Tokyo, Japan, um, tra translating your um, uh, English to Japanese. So uh, very informative and very basic anatomy is very understandable. So that's good for education for residents or students. So uh, we are eager to translate out and go further. Then the basic anatomy is very important and very important that the uh, picture and cadaver and uh, a picture is very good picture, uh, very uh, easy to understand. So uh, we keep continue to uh, work uh, for translation. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Dr. Takashi, what you're doing by translating this for our students and residents and junior neurosurgeons in Japan. We're really transmitting knowledge in a way that I think is important. So your work in translation to Japanese, these lessons is really, really important. So I really thank you for your effort. Uh, you have been tremendous. Uh, Dr. Manuel has his hand up. I just want to make sure we recognize him. Yes. Hello, Professor Salen. Hello. Man. Nice presentation. Thank you. Thank you to all. John, February, uh, Victor. Uh, two questions for you. First is uh, when you come to Moscow, it's going to be very nice to have you here. Yes, and yeah, I was just... Uh, I was just two weeks ago with Professor Kanavala, um, and you know we uh, we uh, uh, you know he is uh, somebody we respect. You know we have, you know we uh, these giants who have contributed so much. We respect them, and he is uh, somebody I respect quite a bit, yeah. and the team at the uh, uh, at the institute there. So uh, hopefully within this coming year, I will be coming uh, to to Moscow and Saint Petersburg. So we will keep you updated for sure. Excellent. And the second one is, who is translating in Spanish uh, okay. in lectures? Yeah, we have a number of people, a team. If you want to text me or uh, Dr. Takashi, we can introduce you to them. We have a team that's doing the translation. If you want to help with that, we, we welcome you. So please uh, either send me a message or Dr. Takashi. He's part of a very global team that's doing the translation to multiple languages. Amazing. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sure. Of course. Uh, any other uh, issues, questions, concerns? I want to respect the time of the uh, other speakers. Uh, so I, I just want to be respectful here. Yeah, thanks, I, Lima. We'll have better interaction in the future. So thank you. Once thank everyone you. Everyone gets used to it. Great. I, I recognize Professor Hisham Bassouni from Germany, who's with us here as well. Uh, and uh, he's, of course, one of the senior speakers, and he'll be speaking with you. Uh, Hello, everybody. Uh, Hisham, I'm sorry, because my flight got canceled overnight from D.C., my meetings got condensed, so I do have to leave. And I no just want to recognize you and uh, the amazing work that you do. And I appreciate of being on this session with you, please. Thank you very Thanks much. You. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Okay, okay Ahmed. <clears throat> yeah, uh, first of all, to me, uh, welcome Professor uh, Hisham Basuni from Germany. Uh, I don't know if he will uh, present his lecture now or later. I can uh, present it as you wish. Okay, uh, you know, Professor uh, Hisham Bassouni is a director of neurosurgical department at uh, Clinicum uh, at uh, Germany. I don't know what is the name of the hospital. Uh, I'm, I'm Berg and Biden, uh, two um, clinics in uh, Bavaria, Northern Bavaria, Germany. Okay, you are welcome, Professor. You can go ahead. Okay. I'm sorry for my voice, it has changed a bit. I'm a bit ill, so but uh, great pleasure to, to join this webinar. So, I hope you can uh, see my screen. Yes, want to make a bigger presentation model. like this? There you go, perfect. And hear me well? Yeah, of course. Yes. Okay, so uh, my topic today is um, about microsurgery of, of, um, of anterior cranial fossa, uh, meningiomas, and particularly uh, olfactory groove meningiomas. And I give you my pers personal perspective uh, to this uh, topic. 
So uh, just for an overview, uh, meningiomas, as you know, are constituting the most frequent primary brain tumors, up to 25%. So one quarter of all primary brain tumors are meningiomas. Uh, there are different uh, figures in the in the literature, but this is a good uh, uh, middle uh, figure to to remember. Uh, Skull-based meningiomas comprise around 20 30 percent of all intracranial meningiomas, and there's the incidence of uh, skull-based meningiomas is about two uh, in in uh, 100,000 population per year. Most of the um, skull-based meningiomas are located in the anterior and middle cranial fossa. Uh, the, the least ones are in the posterior cranial fossa. Um, you know, the olfactory groove um, and also the sphenoid wing meningiomas are constituting the, the greatest portion of the uh, skull-based meningiomas, olfactory groove meningiomas, um, located here, centered around the cribriform fossa. Um, constitute around 10 to 15 percent. Um, and of course, most of these tumors are not restricted to the cribriform plate. When they become larger, they also will extend to the planum sphenoidale. Um, so these are actually, uh, I, would, I would consider both are uh, one unit with different extensions. Um, by the way, uh, sphenoid wing meningiomas are the most frequent um, uh, skull-based meningiomas, constituting around 20%. So what is the treatment goal um, of um, these uh, tumors? Um, and I have to give credit to um, my skull-based mentor, Professor Sam al um, who I think there's no presentation where he does not stress this point to get uh, a complete resection. This includes the involved dura and bone um, at the first surgery. And that's very important but, uh, because every resurgery uh, will be more difficult. And you have got not the planes which you got in the first uh, surgery. And of course, this should be achieved with the preservation of function, amelioration of the patient's condition, and uh, at least um, um, uh, 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 yeah, um, keeping the life quality as it was before surgery or even getting better. It is very important to notice that the ionizing radiation, radiation like gamma knife or linear um, um, or any kind of radiation is the environmental risk factor most strongly associated with meningiomas. De novo meningiomas and as you know from the literature also um, um, uh, malignant progression of meningiomas. So you should um, avoid radiation in grades one, which are most of the calories meningiomas. And also I would um, um, also avoid it in grades two in the atypical meningiomas. So um, a historical uh, um, uh, yeah, view, the first successful resection of uh, an olfactory groove meningioma was performed by the Italian surgeon and also politician uh, Francesco Durant in 1885 by a left frontal craniotomy. So this was the, the unilateral approach to these meningiomas were the first approaches uh, to olfactory groove meningiomas. And see here another uh, historical uh, image uh, from Peter Krause, who was a, a German uh, neurosurgical pioneer. And from his book um, about the um, experiences uh, he got uh, for removal of these tumors. And you see also a unilateral approach. And by the way, also the, uh, at these times, the bone was also left with the flap. It was not taken away. This is a subfrontal um, approach to these meningiomas. So what, are the, uh, what is the surgical anatomy? <clears throat> And the structures in danger during this uh, surgery. First, you got uh, the nervous uh, structures, which is, which is uh, of course, uh, and obviously the frontal lobes, uh, the optic nerves. You can see here with the optic bulb, uh, with the with the olfactory bulb, and the tract, and the optic uh, nerves, which you can see here, um, which are on the 
backside of the tumor. Then the vascular structures, you can see here, are uh, the um, anterior cerebral arteries, particularly the A1 and A2, and the anterior communicant um, 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 complex. And also you have to take care about the ophthalmic artery, which was beautifully um, demonstrated by Salim in his presentation. Um, and you have to take care about not to injure these uh, structures. And you, of course, today, nowadays, we are not performing um, um, angiography routinely, but so this is a bit uh, an old picture, but very um, informative because it shows you that the main um, vascular supply from the skull base of these tumors are coming from the anterior and posterior uh, etmoidal arteries, which are branches of the ophthalmic artery. Um, and of course, you have to remember also that in large tumors, particularly in large tumors, there's also a significant peel uh, vascularization uh, of these tumors. Um, other structures which are uh, uh, nevertheless important are the uh, sinuses, the frontal sinus particularly, the cribriform plate, and of course also the moidal air cells. Uh, you have to consider anatomical variants. For example, an, an, a huge aeration of the frontal sinus and also a very thick bone. Both of these patients had um, uh, olfactory groove meningiomas and you have to deal with these anatomical variants. So what types of approaches we've got? Um, you've got the bifrontal, subfrontal um, approach with or without orbital osteotomy. You've got the frontal lateral approach, as I've already shown you, with a modern variant of um, mini craniotomy, the supraorbital um, keyhole approach. And you've got the pteronal approach from uh, postural lateral. Further, you've got the uh, a bifrontal interhemispheric approach, that's to say without opening of the uh, frontal sinus, and you've got, of course, the extended endoscopic and nasal approaches. So what is my uh, personal preference, um, which I'm using in most of these uh, tumors? These are the anterior midline approaches, either bifrontal subfrontal or bifrontal interhemispheric, mostly bifrontal subfrontal. And in posterior located, uh, particularly planum sphenoidale meningiomas, and of course, planum and, and uh, tercomcellum meningiomas, I'm using the pteronal approach, maybe. What is the reason for this uh, preference? Um, usually, these tumors are, uh, by definition, midline. Um, so they are usually bilateral. Maybe, of course, they can extend one uh, side or the other, but you, usually they extend on both sides. When diagnosed, these tumors are often large or even giant. And um, you will see if you're doing surgery a lot of on, on, this, on these tumors, you will regularly see that they have got uh, an on plaque uh, growth. On the, um, um, on the anterior cranial fossa. So they, they are not restricted to the main uh, tumor bulk, but you will see scattered islands of tumors um, around the anterior cranial fossa. And that's a very important point. Um, you've got a very good um, overview on the whole frontal base. You can uh, directly um, address the hyperostosis and therefore also the vascularization um, of the tumor uh, at the beginning of the surgery. You have a very good overview uh, on the um, cribriform uh, plate and the, olf the, the um, olfactory groove and the bulb and the nerves. And you can protect them and um, preserve them if um, olfaction is an issue to, to, uh, to be protected and preserved. And you've got a very good uh, view on both um, optic nerves and chasm and the optic canals, and you can uh, also open the optic canals via this approach. A very important point, um, which is 
not often mentioned in this uh, topic is the anatomy of the uh, cribriform plate. The cribriform plate may be very deep. Um, uh, and especially anteriorly, it flattens down um, going posteriorly, but it can be as deep as one and a half uh, centimeters or more in the anterior part. So that's very important. If you uh, want to remove these tumors completely, you have to get an overview um, on the, in, in this um, uh, part of the anterior skull. And um, often these tumors, especially when, uh, when they're growing larger, they enter the um, optic canals. So you have to deal also with tumor parts going into the optic canals. And uh, these parts of the tumors may not be seen on preoperative, uh, even um, um, high uh, resolution MRI, um, but they can be seen intraoperatively and you have to search for. And of course, uh, this um, approach provides a large uh, periosteal flap to cover the anterior skull base and uh, to seal any uh, frontal sinus and, um, and uh, parts uh, to prevent a CSF leak. There are drawbacks um, of this approach. The uh, first one is that you usually um, open the um, frontal sinus uh, performing cranialization of frontal sinus. And there's this uh, danger, um, if you do not remove the uh, mucosa well, then there's a danger to get a late mucosid. And also uh, the important, uh, some important structures like the optic nerves, chiasm, and the vessels are on the backside of the tumor when you come in front. So there's a late observation of these uh, important structures. So these are drawbacks. So uh, to give you uh, some examples, um, this uh, is a 51-year-old woman with a large uh, frontal uh, skull base meningioma. You can see it here on the preoperative uh, CT scan with calcification, intratumoral calcification. And the patient uh, was presenting, and this is actually rare in Germany at least, uh, with blindness um, on the right side. Uh, usually the patients are coming before this, but she actually was uh, almost blind on the right side. You see this hyperostosis here on the frontal uh, base. And this is uh, the tumor. You see this hyperostosis here, uh, the tumor encroaching um, on uh, the, the, um, um, the cellar um, area. And you can uh, see that in this, high, uh, this hybrid stosis, there's a viable tumor. So you have to re uh, remove these tumor parts um, in order to get a complete uh, removal of the tumor and prevent recurrence. And also you can see that this tumor enters more on the right side, on the, uh, with, the, with this blindness, uh, and, but also on the left side, it enters the optic canals um, bilaterally. So this is the um, sketch from the surgery. You see here the left optic nerve. The tumor was merely compressing the left optic nerve. So it looks uh, fine. This is the hyperostosis. You have to remove it um, completely. <clears throat> this is usually done by a um, a diamond drill, there is a large hyperostosis, six millimeters or four millimeters. And this is the right optic nerve. You can see it is more involved in the tumor. There's still a plane to dissect the tumor from the optic nerve, from the right optic nerve. But you see that it is um, compressed and also the vascularization of the optic nerve is not, um, uh, not as it was on the left side. And see here that it is intended and um, not looking good. The vessels were uh, closely involved and um, partly uh, engulfed into the tumor. You have to be very careful to uh, dissect the tumor from the vessels. This is the anterior um, cerebral artery. 
not to injure these uh, vessels in order to prevent any ischemia postoperatively. So um, here's the both optic nerves, the chiasm, the lamina terminalis, and you see here a tumor remnant which has to be removed. And you see here the uh, communicating artery. And after removing, you see the pituitary stalk and the back, which is usually protected by arachnoids. So you are not uh, going to uh, enter its uh, integrity. This opening of the optic canal, just showing on one side. On the right side, here you can see this is tumor entering and this has to be removed in order to have a complete tumor resection. So this is um, an MRI after tumor resection. Um, showing a complete uh, tumor removal. Also, this hyperostosis was removed here. And this is the patient six months after surgery. She was doing well. No deficit. So this is the, um, the vision follow-up. This was uh, preoperatively. And this is uh, two months after surgery. So there was, um, um, yeah, regaining vision and this was six months almost complete uh, vision on the right side. So from it's a good functional result after being almost blind. So this is the left side. Also there was amelioration uh, of vision after six months. So um, this is another example. So I'm, I'm showing you different examples with different approaches, but uh, also some more uh, information which I, I think are very important. Uh, this is a 65-year-old woman. Uh, she had weight gain, mu muscle uh, twitching in the face, neck, and right arm, which are not related to the tumor, I thought, at least. But on clinical examination, there was right anosmia and left hyposmia. Otherwise, the, the um, examination was unremarkable. And you see this tumor here, which is... Um, restricted to the midline and you can say okay this is very suitable uh, for an endoscopic approach you can remove this tumor it even shows um, a narrow base and this is the back side of the tumor so restricted to uh, the midline so this um, one can say would be ideal for an, um, an endoscopic endonasal approach you can see also in this um, the anatomy that there are very deep um, olfactory grooves. Um, and uh, so it would be very difficult to, if you would do a frontal lateral approach to go dip into this groove. It is, uh, you can see it using an endoscope, for example, but um, you cannot work on this, um, on this um, uh, yeah, valleys, deep valleys, um, uh, anatomical valleys. You can see the, in the MRI that on the right um, side, uh, where she had complete anosmia, there is uh, completely filled with tumor, the olfactory groove, by, but you can identify the olfactory nerve on the left side. So um, if you want to preserve um, um, uh, smelling uh, and tasting, so it is important uh, that you um, keep this nerve um, intact, which is not uh, possible, by the way, from the endoscopic endonasal approach. So this is positioning uh, of the patient. I performed a frontal interhemispheric, um, uh, bifrontal interhemispheric approach on this uh, patient uh, without opening the uh, uh, frontal sinus. So this is uh, sectioning of the anterior end of the falcs. The tumor was a soft one. Partly suctionable. This is the olfactory nerve on the left side. It was merely um, compressed by the tumor, but not. it could be 
uh, uh, dissected from the tumor. So here it is. And this was the one on the right side. You see it was integrated into the tumor as usual, compressed uh, and dislocated laterally, but this could not be preserved, especially if you want to remove the tumor in the bulb, um, um, olfactory bulb area, which is uh, here. Uh, so you cannot uh, remove it. Uh, you can uh, preserve this um, olfactory nerve. These are the vessels. You have to be take uh, care uh, not to injure them. And now this is very interesting. This is the optic nerve. You can see this is tumor. These are tumor islands here in the optic canal. So these were not visible in the MRI, in the preoperative MRI. And this surely would have been missed by any endoscopic um, approach. Uh, but it's very important because the recurrent in this area, this is a strategic area, would um, uh, would uh, affect vision. So this is the view. This is uh, then sealing of the frontal base in order to prevent a CSF leak. Um, also, I got a nice parosteal flap. To uh, seal the frontal base. So this is the approach. It is uh, above the frontal sinus, not um, uh, disturbing its in integrity by frontal um, approach. And this is the MRI postoperatively uh, showing a complete, interestingly, uh, which I did not expect actually, was a cessation of the uh, muscle twitching. Um, and the she had um, um, uh, osmia, she had, she could smell after surgery, so it was not changed uh, in comparison to before surgery. So uh, osmation was preserved. And this is the, um, the cosmetic result, it is uh, quite reasonable. Um, this is another patient, a four-year-old woman. She had uh, two tumors, um, which were incidental findings, but uh, both showed growth. This is a small a uh, sphenoid wing meningioma, but within one year uh, it, grow, it showed um, uh, growth. And also a small olfactory groove meningioma here, which also grew in this uh, one year. And she decided um, uh, to have these tumors removed. So in this case, of course, I use a um, pteronal um, uh, approach. Uh, mainly focusing, of course, on the sphenoid wing meningioma, but also um, removing this um, olfactory groove meningioma, which I show here. So this is the um, olfactory nerve. And this is tumor beneath the olfactory nerve and the uh, gyrus rectus. And um, yeah, dener denaturation of the uh, frontal base for this tumor. So this is the post-operative MRI showing complete removal of both tumors. And what is interesting is that this patient actually, I did not ask her because I would not have um, expected it. She said, is it possible that also my olfaction became better? So I think it was due to this pressure of this small olfactory groove meningioma. This is another example which shows you that you have to be flexible in, in planning your, your um, approaches. This is a 71 year old woman with a giant anterior skull base meningioma. She had severe mental disturbance. They actually came, came back from holiday and she did uh, crazy things in the holiday and her husband told uh, or took her to the hospital because this was not uh, the usual case with her, with his wife. And she also had pituitary insufficiency. Um, and this can be explained by an extension of the tumor into the pituitary fossa. So this actually, it looks like two tumors which are yeah, kissing here. But um, yeah, it was one main bulk. You see this, the, there's a difference in, 
in uh, enhancement, but it was uh, one large tumor mass intraoperatively. In this patient, I did a combined uh, bifrontal, subfrontal, interhemispheric, and peroneal approach to get this, uh, this tumor uh, removed. So these are the postoperative MRIs. And this is the patient six uh, days after surgery. And she already had amelioration of the mental function, but which it took um, several months to become uh, almost normal as, be, as before uh, uh, the disease. Uh, this is another example, uh, a 72-year-old man who um, had a syncope, which was probably unrelated to the tumor. And so this tumor was an incidental finding. Uh, the only specific symptom was a right-sided uh, uh, hyposemia, and this is the MRI. Uh, so in this uh, tumor, I uh, chose a right supra um, or, orbital mini uh, craniotomy. You can see it here, the steps. I'm uh, using an incision in the eyebrow, not above and not uh, palpebral. And incising uh, the temporal muscle at the anterior end of the um, superior temporal line, you can see it here behind the uh, orbital pillar. Here the dura was uh, already opened, it was very sticky to the bone and then getting a, a small bone flap, you can see here. Then checking if uh, there has been any opening of the frontal sinus, which is very important. You have to address this during the surgery. And then getting off the any irregularities of the uh, frontal, also to have a good view on the tumor and the tumor base. And then detaching the tumor from the frontal base. And this is the optic nerve. You, you can see the protecting arachnoid membranes. You have to keep them as far as possible intact. Debulking of the tumor, it was not possible to get it out uh, on block. Uh, so now it's uh, reduction volume, it was possible. So this is the optic nerve. You can also see that here are tumor islands which had to be uh, treated. They have to be at least coagulated, denaturated, and in uh, I checked uh, uh, in the op uh, optic canal, but did not find any tumor. You can open it, of course. Um, but I didn't uh, do it uh, in this patient. And this is an endoscopic view. You can see here the um, optic nerve on the right side. This is the left optic nerve. Chiasma would be here. And this is the uh, lanum sphenoidale. This is the olfactory nerve on the right side. It was protected. This is going into the bulb and the fossa. And then you have to uh, cover, of course, uh, duroplasty. And this is the opening of the bone, which is um, uh, two and a half uh, per one and a half centimeters. It's a uh, skin closure. So this is removal of the tumor completely, um, as you can see here. And this is the mini craniotomy, 3D CT reconstruction and this is the patient um, after surgery you cannot uh, almost cannot see this uh, the um, the incision um, so it is a good uh, cosmetic result interestingly this tumor was a great tool it was an atypical meningioma so um, is there an age limit I would say you have, it depends on the patient. I'll show you two cases uh, quick uh, in patients 80 and above. 
This was an uh, eight-year-old woman with an epileptic fit, a mental disturbance. And this is a pre-operative MRI and post-operative MRI, large tumor removed. Um, and this is the patient after surgery and she had no post-operative deficits and regained full life quality. Uh, this is another patient, 82 year old um, um, man who had a large uh, edema who had uh, presented with decreased consciousness and was suspected to have a stroke. And this is the post-operative MRI um, and uh, tumor removal, a complete tumor removal uh, in this patient was also possible. And this is the patient after surgery again, also regained full life quality. And he had a torticollis uh, since uh, 30 years ago. Um, so this was uh, present pre-op. What about complications? Complications do happen. And uh, but I would say they can, um, almost all can be uh, prevented. Um, so I would show you one of the complications. Um, a 65 year old woman, uh, she presented with mental slowing over months. And she had this quite curious uh, tumor um, with a, with a, var, a large um, uh, edema. Um, and um, yeah, the, the edema was, was uh, extensive in this patient. And now um, during resection of the tumor, I pulled on parts of the tumor and there was an arterial tear here. So it took me actually uh, a long time. I think it were hours. Uh, I felt it as, as it were days during surgery to, um, to get, uh, yeah, to get this um, uh, arterial bleeding uh, stopped. But finally I succeeded by putting a clip um, on the uh, tiny tearing artery. And this is the patient uh, CT, uh, angio CT after surgery. Of course, you have to control it by angio CT in order to have also um, uh, to see if uh, there is not any uh, pseudoaneurysm uh, development in these cases. So this is after reimplantation of the um, bone two months after surgery. This is the postoperative MRI tumor was removed. Um, and uh, fortunately, also the patient had no uh, neurological deficits and uh, made a complete recovery. So, um, in summary, and the, to my take-home messages for you is, um, um, I think I have demonstrated that um, the meningiomas of the anterior skull base um, have an uh, often an on-plaque growth and remote tumor islands beside and beyond uh, the main tumor bulk. And there's often also an encroachment into the optic uh, canals, uh, particularly in larger tumors. Um, so I think this, these um, uh, aspects are more the rule than they are the exceptions, even if they are not visible on preoperative MRI. What are the implications of these um, observations? Um, I think um, that an overview is always, always more favorable than an underview if you're going from the endoscopic view uh, in, in regard to complete uh, tumor resection and recurrence prevention. And I think careful bilateral inspection of the optic canal should be part, particularly in large tumors, in these um, uh, procedures. In approach, uh, these tumors uh, look uh, uniform. They are in the olfactory group of canum sphenoidale, but uh, nonetheless, the approach should be individualized and uh, it should consider the tumor factors like the extent of the tumor, site of the hyperstosis, which should be removed, clinical aspects, if they're if there's a, a still a smelling ability uh, and which should be preserved, it is a very important um, uh, yeah, aspect to preserve smelling, uh, very um, uh, important for life quality. 
And uh, I have shown some anatomical uh, factors like the depth of the cribriform plate, the frontal sinus, the thickness of the frontal bone. All these have to uh, be taken into consideration uh, in this surgery. And of course, as I um, told you, that complications are generally preventable. Um, the example I showed you, don't pull on two more parts in order to avoid risk of arterial tear. Always keep in mind that uh, these tumors, especially if they are large, they have a peel vascularization also, uh, and uh, um, vessels are going into the tumor, um, uh, particularly on the posterior circumference. A CSF leak uh, can also be prevented by good sealing of the anterior uh, cranial fossa. So thank you very much. Thank you, Professor, for a great uh, presentation. Uh, now, if there is an uh, interpretation or question, you can ask Professor. Yeah, I'm ready for answer you. Okay, there's some wonders in hand. <clears throat> I will see. Dr. Gibran, you can talk. Excuse me? You see in the chat, someone raised their hand. Yeah, it's me. Go ahead. Okay, Dr. Hisham, how are you? Thank you very much. I hope you're fine. Thank you very it much. It was a nice lecture, and I want to ask you if there is a CSF leaks after operation or not. If, if there is. Yeah. Um, you should prevent them. It is not... Um, you know, if you are doing a large surgery and you, you, uh, you are getting the tumor out and remove it. And this is generally spoken for, for all um, skull based um, um, meningiomas also in the posterior fossa. You have to take the time to seal uh, the, um, the skull base. You have to take your time and you have to take uh, every measure to prevent CSF. It can happen. Uh, and it happened to me, um, as far as I remember, not in the anterior skull base, but in the posterior skull base. It happens, especially in the larger petrosal approaches. Uh, but uh, you can, uh, I believe you can always uh, prevent it. So it is uh, actually, I would be very uh, strict and say it is a surgical uh, failure if uh, CSF leak happens. Of course, the larger the opening, the more will be the incidence of CSF leak. And this is actually what we're seeing in the endoscopic and the nasal approaches, which are doing um, a large um, opening of the anterior skull base. Um, and, um, and consequently, there's also higher incidence of CSF leak. So you have to address these, um, um, any opening, uh, and to, to look very carefully if there's any opening of the frontal sinus, for example, if there is any sense in the cribriform plate, um, tumors um, are usually not going into the, into the um, nasal cavity um, um, primarily, but in recurrences uh, they do. So you have to address and uh, you have to cover and make every uh, measure to cover these um, the skull base very well. Okay. And so it is a, so uh, it, is reform, a it is a preventable uh, uh, complication. Okay. Did you perform you know lumbar drain you know before operation or not? No, I'm I, I never perform um, lumbar drainage because I think and also if you if you recognize I'm not using uh, using retractors in in these surgeries because. Um, CSF is your best friend. So if you are patient and you are, um, uh, um, let the CSF go out, you are getting a relaxation of the, of the, um, of the intracranial conditions and you can um, continue without um, uh, pressure on the nerve structures. I'm not using okay. uh, lumbar drainage. 
Thank you so much. With pleasure. Hello, Professor Basuni. Hello, Victor. This is Victor Hugo from Mexico City. Uh, when you are uh, resecting uh, anterior meningiomas, uh, do you used to uh, go to the anterior ethmoidal artery? Because uh, this artery is uh, most of the times uh, irrigating the, the tumor, this kind of tumor. And once you um, coagulate these uh, small arteries, anterior ethmoidal artery, you can resect uh, with a very good advantage this kind of tumors. Yes, uh, this is, um, of course, I know you're an expert in anatomy. <laughs> so, um, it's, um, it's, um, it's why I, I, I prefer these um, approaches from, uh, from um, you have got a very good overview on the anterior skull base. And um, I always approach these tumors basically. So along the, uh, the anterior uh, uh, cranial fossa. Um, so um, actually I'm not using often the interhemispheric approach because then you are late um, uh, getting into the main uh, vascular supply. But my main approach is detaching the tumor from the skull base and also with coagulation um, of the main vascular supply. So this is the main vascular supply coming from the skull base. Um, and that's why I also like uh, these approaches, uh, particularly in, in the very large tumors, where I know that they have uh, quite um, heavily vascularized. And I've shown you um, the, the DSA. We're not performing it anymore uh, routinely uh, before surgery, but you can very well see the ethmoidal or the even hypertrophied uh, at model arteries uh, in vascularization of these tumors. But always you. you have to remind or remember also that especially in large tumors, there's also a significant uh, peel um, vascularization. And so that's that's a problem if you are, yeah, you are tired and you want to get the tumor out and you're pulling on, on parts of the tumors, particularly on the, on the posterior circumference, you can, it can happen what I showed you as a complication. You can tear um, uh, to, uh, um, uh, uh, artery and this will take you longer. And yeah, it, it's not, uh, not a good complication. Any complication is bad, but uh, this is it's very Thank annoying. Thank you, Professor Bassini. With pleasure. I think uh, Ayman Bayas. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Thank you, Professor Hisham. Thank you very much for your nice lecture. Uh, yeah, my question about uh, two, two, uh, two uh, the first question is about uh, what about the angry brain? Or, I mean, the frontal oedema. Do you do you hesitate when you see a oedema? You you, you consider that uh, you, you may have a swelling brain. I, I, I saw that you show us one case with a uh, remarkable oedema and you, you proceed with the procedure. Uh, uh, my other question, please. Uh, can you hear me well, uh, Professor Hisham? I, I can hear you. Continue. Yes. Uh, about the reconstruction of the skull base and the frontal. Do you use mini plate? Do you use stitch or do you use another uh, something else? If you can light, the, light us, please. So, so to the... the first part of your question about the angry brain um, actually um, it, it is a it is an unfortunate um, um, uh, um, uh, yeah nomenclature to, to, to say it's angry brain um, you have to in, in these large edemas you have to be very careful with the brain as always in all all the um, um, in all the um, uh, yeah, intracranial procedures. Um, but uh, you should not, it's my belief, um, particularly in these, um, uh, in these uh, large edemas, you should not use retractors because if you talk about an angry brain, 
it will get more angry if you use the retractors. So, so don't make it more angry, but don't make it more swollen. Um, actually, I've shown uh, two cases, the one where the complication happened and the one also the old uh, man, 82-year-old man with a very huge uh, edema. Um, and um, I'm not using also retraction in these uh, patients uh, because the, actually the tumor is giving you the space. And um, this edema will not lead to a closure of this um, of this uh, space uh, the tumor gives you, even in, in, uh, in edema of the brain. So um, you can continue with the surgery and remove the tumor and use uh, just your bipolar and suction uh, and um, uh, yeah, decompress the brain and uh, it will not, uh, not uh, disturb you actually. Of course, there are differences in, in brains which are very relaxed, uh, where there's no edema and uh, very edematous um, uh, brains, but um, actually can continue. Uh, so the uh, second part of your um, question, I'm not using uh, mini plates um, routinely. Um, if, um, if there is, um, I, I'm um, even, Larger defects of the anterior skull base, I cover it with um, um, with periosteum, which is a, a perfect material, not yet uh, reached by any um, artificial um, or industrial product. It is a great uh, uh, material to cover the uh, the, uh, the brain um, and uh, the, the, the skull base. I'm sorry, uh, so I'm not using uh, mini plates. Um, of course, um, uh, mini plates for reconstruction or, uh, or, um, or um, uh, putting back the bone, uh, I'm using either mini plates or craniofix, um, uh, one of these materials. But not for the skull base. Uh, thank you, Professor. Thank you for your answer. Thank you so much. Uh, please, uh, about the oedema, do you use any medication preoperative? Do you? prepare the patient with dexamethasone or anti-epileptic drugs or something like this, or uh, I mean, uh, preoperatively with, with, the, with those large oedema. Do you use any medication preoperative? Yes, and I'm using dexamethasone and it's uh, good to pre-treat the patient for some days with dexamethasone. Um, I'm not using anti-epileptic um, drugs uh, prophylactically. Um, and um, because uh, it is not proven that uh, they will be of any benefit if, if, if there was no uh, epileptic fit already. Um, so, um, and I'm also not using um, antibiotic uh, prophylactically, uh, just a single shot uh, during surgery, and that's, that's all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So John, it's your turn, <laughs> or Ahmed. Okay, professor. Uh, okay, uh, now I'm gonna give mic to my colleague, uh, Madalina from Romania. You can go ahead, Madalina. Hello everyone, and uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Bassini for this engaging and interesting lecture. And Perfect. also, uh, Professor Abdurao for, uh, for the one uh, before you. Both amazing presentations, helping our students understand much better the neuroanatomy and the neurosurgery. My name is Madalina Popescu. I'm the president of Dendi Romania. And uh, please, please allow me to congratulate Ahmed from uh, Dendi Yemen and Nicole from Dendi Bolivia for this amazing event and their hard work for making this all happen. And I would also like to address special thanks to Dr. John Bennett and Neurosurgical TV for their continuous support for our Dandy Clubs and their implication. And thank you for making such events known worldwide. Without going any further, I, it is my greatest pleasure and honor to introduce to you the next speaker, uh, Professor Adnan Alawadi, uh, president of Yemen Neurosurgeons chapter and member of World 
Federation of Neurosurgery Societies. Professor, uh, whenever you want, you may start your presentation. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, nice to meet you with this uh, presentation. Uh, thank you for Dr. Salim Abdelhaif and Dr. Uh, Shambesioni for their uh, nice presentation. Uh, my lecture is, uh, will go fast for the lecture. Um, you see everyone? Yeah, perfect. Okay. Now let's start my uh, case presentation about the traumatic CSA flake. Uh, this is a very nosy uh, uh, topic for CSA flake after trauma and uh, taking a bad decision about to operate or not to operate a patient in a traumatic uh, case. First, we will discuss the basic anatomy, which, which was described by Dr. Salim Abdurraouf before and Dr. Risham Bassioni. Uh, you know that the frontal uh, skull base is from the frontal bone up to the uh, posterior cranial. So we cerebriform plate and the frontal air sinus. Uh, and this is the opening of the frontal air sinus with the ethmoidal air cells also behind, be, uh, below the frontal uh, skull base. This is uh, the view of the anterior skull base, the cerebriform blade and the femboria for the olfactory nerves. Uh, this is the cranoidal process. This is also an anatomic base for the frontal bone, ethmoidal bone, nasal bone, and uh, this is the maxillary bone. This is the coronal blade, show you the frontal base. This is nasal cavity, this is the osmoidal, and this is the maxillary sinus. For the breast skull fracture, we have generally classified it as a symbol or a compound breast fracture with depending upon breaching of the galea and uh, the skin or up to the galea. If the skin is not, uh, or the skin breach is not involving the galea, it will assemble cranial debris fracture, but if it's involved the galea and go forward to the deep laceration, we compose it as, or we call it as a compound debris cranial fracture. Now we have one case we'll describe. What is the best ideal work for management of a debris skull fracture? either to operate or not to operate. For a debris skull fracture, the indication for operation is simple. If you have a debris skull fracture, which uh, displays uh, displace more than one centimeter or uh, more than the half of the thickness of the skull, or is a contaminated, very contaminated, you have indication for operation. Or if there is an involvement of the air sinuses, cosmetic uh, disfiguring, or there is uh, an indication for an underlying hematoma or pathology that you need to operate. Uh, you should operate and not hesitating for this kind of uh, trauma. In our case, we have for involving the frontal air sinus, we have to uh, describe if there is the anterior turbulence displaced or not. If there is fractured evidence of the nasofrontal outflow obstruction of uh, the nasal sinus duct, if there is an obstruction for the, these nasal ducts, you will see accumulation of the mucus, mucosa, mucus uh, secretion, which will enlarge and uh, make uh, mucosal which uh, is a risk for infection and uh, mass uh, compression for the brain. If there is a displacement of the posterior tablet greater than the thickness of the skull, because this is a predictor likely for laceration, uh, presence of refractory CSF flake, all these features are indication for operation of the 
the bridge fracture over the frontal air sinus. What we will do for this kind of fracture? Either we will do simple reconstruction involving the either in situ elevation and blating, or we have to do either obliteration procedure or cranialization procedure. The difference is that in obliteration, we would we should close the nasal sinonasal duct either with fat graft, but with cranialization, we should cover the cranial cavity, the, the sinus cavity and uh, isolate it from the brain by putting uh, either a fasciolata or the bricranial flap over the frontal air sinus to isolate it from the, the brain. In this kind of procedure, you have to remove all instruments you have used in obliteration or canalization of the frontal air sinus from the procedure because it will be the, this, uh, considered as uh, anesterol after this uh, procedure and you should use another instrumentation to process uh, further. What are the indications for CSF fistula surgical treatment? You know that the conservative treatment for CSF leg, we have to consider the duration of the conservative treatment the type of the fracture, if there is a lake, uh, if, they, if you have already done the make a patient to rest, give him uh, acetazolamine, uh, try uh, to do uh, uh, lumbar drain and to exclude the presence of numerous loss in the presence of CSF lake, that should, uh, it may be dangerous to develop the a herniation or a tension pneumocephalus in the presence of lumbar drain, uh, development of meningitis. There is a meningitis you will consider directly for uh, surgical treatment. Uh, if there is a, uh, there is a CSF trap uh, or uh, there is a mucosal or uh, underlying uh, pathology that indication for operation. Uh, another indication for operation is the severe anterior scabus defect evidence by CT scan or on the stomach that the brain is externally herniated through the uh, skull defect. What are the surgical techniques? We'll discuss it in, uh, that from the beginning in the position of the patient, uh, in the subine position, myofi myofield declam, is kinesis to be a bicoronal craniotomy above frontal with preservation of the precranial flap as a singular, we will uh, give you an uh, example for the rest of the procedure. What we will do uh, after that, we will do cranialization of the frontal air sinus, uh, mucosal removal by monobolar coagulation, fat graft, and gill form soaked with the iodine. Uh, then we'll stitch uh, the bricranium uh, to the dura and opening the dura, a reconstruction then, the anterior skull base defect, and uh, we will close uh, the procedure by sub uh, subdural uh, drain, uh, epidural drain, sorry, and bone fixed in position, and the incision closed in the patient layer. In our case, it's a 30 male patient, post RTA with open compound frontal bone fracture involving the anterior and posterior wall of the frontal air sinus, fracture of the frontal uh, base bone. Patient had a CC plate from the first day of trauma treated by simple skin debridement and suturing in Countryside Health Center. One month later, with, he presented with a severe headache, neck rigidity, and fever with continuous CCP. Controlled by a brain CT scan showing pneumocephalus, big frontal mucosal, patient treated for meningitis in ICU, then be repaired for surgical repair of the skull base fracture and frontal air sinus cranialization. This is Directly post trauma brain CT scan show fracture in the, the frontal base bone. There is hematoma in the nasal cavity. You will see here fracture in both anterior and posterior wall of the frontal air sinus and also in the supraorbital ridge. 
and you will see you will see a small amount of pneumocephalus here that indicating this is the dura is injured. This is the CT scan directly post trauma. Patient uh, already uh, treated only by skin closure. We are reviewing the CT scan in the first uh, day of trauma. There is a big indication for uh, direct repair of the frontal air sinus. Uh, the fracture line is involving both anterior and posterior uh, wall of the frontal air sinus. There is CC plague, there is a pneumocephalus. All these parameters are indication for, for direct operation and not for just, just a simple skin closure. For that reason, the patient, after one month, developed this picture. He, be, he came with a continuous CC plague, a big mucosal. There is a pneumocephalus all around the brain. Here's the 3D we will show you in uh, more detail. So this is the frontal base, okay? This is still opening or fracture of the anterior and posterior frontal air sinus. This pneumocephalus and mucosal. This is a sagittal plane. So this is a defect in the skull base. This is a 3D. So the supraorbital fracture and the nasal bone cavity fracture. Uh, sorry, the frontal air sinus fracture. You have a coronal view. This is the coronal view showing this is the mucosal connected with the nasal cavity due to some obliteration of the nasal, the sinoductal, sinonasal duct, which lead to this picture of mu, big mucosal, which may, uh, made uh, a massive effect on the uh, frontal uh, brain tissue. Patient was admitted to ICU and the uh, routine investigation was done, treated as a case of meningitis and prepared for frontal skull base uh, uh, repair. And uh, all the routine investigation was done. The brain CT scan without contrast, uh, systemography was not done. Uh, medical fitness and the written consent was uh, taken. This is the preoperative CT scan after treatment for uh, pneumocephalus and uh, meningitis show a big mucosal, but still there is a patient complaining of a CEC plaque. What is the, our surgical technique? In a general anesthesia and supine position with head uh, fixed in my field frame, and the uh, right type prepared for a facial graft, antibiotic given as a start, and uh, continued for one week post-operative. Skin incision is a bicoronal incision, uh, one centimeter uh, in front of the targets of the air to the other side, from the right to left. And uh, craniotomy was done for, uh, for bifrontal craniotomy. This is the precranial flap we should preserve to use for reconstruction or for cranialization of the skull base. We dissect it as a single piece for reconstruction of the skull base and for uh, cranialization of the frontal air sinus. This is the craniotomy figure, a borehole, done keyhole, and then uh, by frontal craniotomy as a single piece. Then we do obliteration and granulization of the frontal air sinus first by removal of the mucous membrane of the frontal air sinus and uh, soak with the, cover it with the pad, which was taken from the thigh and uh, as, uh, with dual form soaked in uh, iodine. Then the precranial flap was covered and suture to the anterior wall of the dura 
for granularization process and isolate the frontal air sinus from the field of the anterior uh, frontal base for reconstruction. Then the dura was opened and the frontal air and the frontal uh, anterior frontal skull base was reconstructed by the same maneuver as we do for granulation of the frontal air sinus. We do it for the outmodal and the cerebral complete by fat uh, and uh, facial attack taken from the right thigh and uh, followed by by glue. Then the dura closed in the water tight and the epidural drain was uh, uh, fixed and the bone was uh, fixed in position by suturing and the skin was closed in Matilaya. Most operatively, it is the stop of the CCF lake. This is the view of the most operative CT scan. We show some hematoma in the bed of the mucosil. The then was containing less than 30 cc blood. The patient was discharged in the fourth day, most operative day. One month later, patient presented uh, to our uh, clinic, have no complaint, no CCF lake. We have a small wound dehiscent in the right thigh, which was uh, they, uh, treated as a superficial infection and was recovered. This is a small hypodense area in the frontal, uh, in the left frontal area, in the area of the mucosil. Now the patient doing well, have no complaint. And uh, is uh, for further follow up. What our recommendation? Our recommendation, first of all, is complete external mucosa of the sinus should be removed to prevent further reaccumulation of the mucus secreted by the remnant of the mucosa in the in the sinus, which uh, may. Uh, cause another mucosal in a delayed patient. The surgical indication for traumatic brain injury guidelines should be followed as uh, level one class three scientific evidence should be followed. And this is uh, uh, what is uh, we described in uh, relation to the frontal air sinus fracture involvement of the anterior and posterior wall. If there is uh, uh, the signs of dural uh, involvement by pneumocephalus, uh, CC plate, these all the uh, indication for direct surgical repair and not just for simple repair uh, of the skin uh, and uh, let the patient go for more complication, including meningitis, which be lethal and uh, more morbid for the patient and also for a difficult reconstruction after uh, a while from the uh, injury. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Stanley. It's a short time, I know. Okay. Stephanie Nicole is there. Good afternoon, everyone. Nice to meet you. It's a great honor for me to be here. I'm Nicole Fuentes. I'm a fifth year medical student from Bolivia. Uh, when I first got the invitation from Ahmed, I received his call uh, a month ago, and I see. I, I thought this idea was great of organizing this joint event uh, as a way of introduce, introducing the GIME Neurosurgeons chapter. And I want to congratulate Dr. Adnan for always being supporting the team in Yemen. I know he's always uh, kept in touch with them. And I also want to congratulate Dr. Hisham for his great presentation, as well as Dr. Salim, and of course, Dr. Bennett, that he's always supporting us and lending us his platform, Neurosurgical TV, for this kind of events. So it's very nice for me to be here, and I want to congratulate each and every one of you. Thank you, 
Hello, Professor Adnan. Yes. How are you? Fine, thank you. Fine. Uh, I just want to thank Professor Adnan for this nice lecture. And I want to thank him because he always supported for all the neurosurgical residents in Yemen. Thank you, Professor thank Adnan. Thank you, my colleague. Thank you, my Dr. Ayman. <laughs> you are the best friend. And we will do this See for uh, all the staff of our country and helping all the neurosurgical doctor and resident in our country for more educational purpose and for more uh, continuous medical education. Thank you. Thank you so much. See you soon, inshallah. Allah yeah. Okay, I would like to do something there. Uh, you know, uh, Professor Igor Katu will join us, but uh, she may take a few time to join us. So uh, we will wait for her a few minutes. So no you problem. can keep asking and discussing, discussing till uh, she join us. Uh, hello. Yes. Uh, so Dr. thank you. Dr. I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Victor Hugo. He was uh, raising his hand. No, Dr. Good afternoon, Dr. Dr. Wanted to make a question, Dr. Takashi Kon. Okay. Uh, hello, good evening. Uh, good evening. I'm Takashi Kon from Tokyo, Japan. Uh, thank, thank you for the nice lecture. Uh, so we uh, sometimes uh, encounter traumatic brain injury and CSF leakage and very difficult to treat. And uh, epidural was subdural abscess, uh, sometimes very difficult to treat. We uh, continue um, the antibiotics. Uh, in your experience, so doctor, so what, what is... Uh, kind of antibiotics is mainly used uh, for how long? Uh, you said that uh, one week um, uh, antibiotics will be enough, but so, uh, what to cover? Which kind of, what kind of uh, bacteria uh, you're covering? Already the patient was admitted in our ICU for about one month for treatment of meningitis. He was covered under uh, triple antibiotic to cover a gram positive gram and gram negative and anaerobic gram bacteria. Negative. We are routinely use uh, vancomycin, plagil, and uh, ciproxim as a routine antibiotic uh, for this kind of uh, infection. Unfortunately, the CSIP uh, culture and sensitivity was negative for all his uh, uh, culture taken around the, all the months uh, because he was already in the antibiotic, but uh, CSIP lake is, uh, may decrease the severity of uh, meningitis in this kind of trauma. So we always use the antibiotic uh, to cover this three uh, pathological uh, important gram positive and gram negative uh, bacteria and also anaerobic bacteria. Uh, the duration is uh, for one week is uh, that uh, continuation uh, for the uh, previous one month. So the duration of the treatment, it was uh, five weeks total. So we uh, stopped after one week for uh, this reason as a uh, all the culture was negative, so we uh, we see that so one ma one week is enough. Okay, thank you. So, and uh, I want to leave another question. So, uh, because uh, uh, in Japan uh, it was relatively safe and very few uh, experience of stab wounds or gunshot wound. But uh, as you know, the so, uh, former prime minister was shot in a gunshot. So uh, we are very uh, fearful about the such kind of. Uh, uh, injury increasing. So I want to uh, know at, uh, how to manage the stab wound, the gunshot wound uh, direct, directory. And uh, firstly, we have to prepare. So uh, I want to learn about some uh, everything about uh, head injury other than trauma, uh, gunshot wound or stab wounds. Thank you. Thank you. Can you repeat your question, please? Uh, yeah, I want to leave a comment. So I have to prepare for the other than the head injury. So a uh, gunshot wound and a stab wound, stab wound at, by the knife. Uh, because in Japan, unfortunately, yes, 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 yes. yeah, in Japan, increasing and the former prime minister was shot. So we have to prepare for those uh, management. You know that uh, this penetrating, penetrating blade injury well, mm -hmm. we have a lecture before, uh, maybe one month uh, with the Perennial uh, Neurosurgical Society about the penetrating brain injury. It's a uh, big uh, topic that uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's depending about the minimal debridement or uh, if, uh, if you will do a big debridement, 
in all the modalities that minimal deprivation of the dura and the fragment and the skin wound is uh, have a better prognostic effect than the diffuse deprivation and the tract uh, uh, trajectory of the bullet or the stab wound uh, or the knife uh, deprivation inside the brain. You will have uh, more uh, brain tissue damage. You will have uh, more sequela, more uh, uh, consumption of uh, uh, medical uh, support, and uh, it's a time-consuming. And so for a better result, uh, you will uh, minimal debris is the best for uh, this kind of uh, trauma. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Exactly. So. You're welcome. Okay, Ahmed, Ahmed, you there? Yeah. Nicole, are you there? Yes, yes, I'm here. Okay. Uh... When, well, uh, I mean, when uh, you contacted uh, Professor Yoko, I mean, the last time you contacted Professor Yoko Katu. So right now it's like 4 a.m., 4.15 a.m. And she said she would join at 5.30 a.m. One hour and a half? Yeah. Okay. But we have to... Time to wait. I don't think I'll be able to come back. So I guess we'll have to wrap it up, Ahmed. Okay, you can do it. Unfortunately, I can't continue for another hour and a half, unfortunately. Sorry to should, say. Should we start again? Uh, well. What do you think, we'll, Nicole? We'll talk, we'll talk about it later, okay? We'll, we'll examine what's going on. Okay. Or perhaps we'll talk about it. Maybe we could arrange a webcast tomorrow or something. Would that be okay? I, I, cannot, I cannot do it today. Okay. How do you find Nicole? Uh, I, uh, I can ask her through her email. And Dr. Bennett, if you can tell us a time so that we convert it to Japan time and Ask her on her email. Yeah, it'll probably be tomorrow, though, not today. Okay. But, well, obviously, it's too late in the Japan now. So Yeah, yeah. So we'll, we'll, we'll straighten it out through email. Should we postpone this uh, presentation till another time or to tomorrow? Yeah, I'll let you know. Uh, I'm so sorry about we'll, this. We'll try to shoot for tomorrow. We'll try to shoot for tomorrow. Yeah. Dr. Ahmed, I think it's uh, to arrange it with another lecture is to be better and to arrange it with uh, for uh, Japanese local time for that uh, doctor uh, can uh, prepare herself and to be ready for the topic. Actually, um, I'm so sorry about this miss, you know, I thought this may take longer time. So uh, Professor Yoko uh, is not wrong uh, anyway. Um, but anyway, I'm so sorry about this miss and about this problem. I'm no so problem. sorry. That's okay. It was a good conference. Thank you very much. I have to leave. Thank you, Dr. Isham. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you very much nice for your education. You. Thanks, everybody, for working Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Free time. Thank you. Time it was great. Hey, everyone. Nice to meet you. Thank Bye. You. See you, everybody. We'll keep in contact. Nice to meet you all. Goodbye. Bye. You will be in contact, John. Okay, Ahmed. Thank you. I'll be in contact. Okay. And watch my email, watch my Facebook account. Uh, that's why I'll, I'll make the announcement, okay? Okay, Ahmed. Or I'll write to you directly. Okay? Uh, I didn't hear you. What did you say? I'll write to you directly. I'll text you directly. Okay, okay. And let you, let you know, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, Zulish. Okay.